Thank you so much. It's great to be here today. Um, we are in the middle of a series called Your Story. Uh, I, I'm drawn to this idea, this topic of story. Uh, I'm sure that you are as well. Uh, I, I have a four-year-old daughter. She loves stories. Um, just a couple days ago, she came to me and she said, Daddy, I want you to tell me a story about your childhood. I'm like, okay, I'll tell you a story. So um, I, I told her about this house we lived in that had the, these woods behind the house. And in these woods, it went down the whole length of the street. And um, up in the woods, me and my friends, we made these paths with our bikes so that we could ride kind of from one end of the street to the other, but up in the woods. And so we made this kind of bike trail, and then we would time ourselves to see if we get from one end to the other who could make it the fastest. We built jumps out of dirt in there, and it seems like they were these massive mounds. Really, they were probably these little short hills. And we could maybe get a tire off the ground, but we would fly through the woods dodging trees. And I'm, I'm telling my four-year-old daughter, Kristen, about this, and she's... She, her eyes are getting big. She's just riding a bike. She still used training wheels, but she's riding a bike. We just moved into a home that has all these woods behind the house, and so I'm trying to kind of spur her on. You know, you can make your own trail through the woods. We could time you as you go flying down and dodge trees and go, go over these jumps, and she just loves stories. Now, she also loves stories at bedtime. Uh, most kids do. Um, my wife, she loves to read stories to our kids. She'll um, she'll grab a book. We go through a number of different chapter books, and our four-year-old will just sit there and just soak it all in. She'll finish a chapter, and she'll say, one more, one more chapter, and so we'll read more to her because she loves stories. Now, as we take her to bed and, and lay her down, um, she always wants us to tell her a story and make one up, and it's always about the same thing. Um, she wants a story about Princess Puppy. I don't know what Princess Puppy is. I don't know where she got this idea, but she wants a story, and it has to be made up, and she wants it told as a song about Princess Puppy, and um, so I always ask her, as, as soon as she says Princess Puppy, I said, oh, and what, what should we name Princess Puppy, and it's always the same thing. It's Celestia. I don't know where Celestia comes from, but she always wants us to sing a story, and so I, I kind of I defer bedtime to the wife because... I think she's probably a little better at making up the princess puppy stories about Celestia than I am. But even our four-year-old, Kristen, she connects with stories. Um, a, a few of you might know my mother-in-law, Martha Sue. Um, she is going through some pretty big health uh, things right now. She has declined quite a bit. Recently, um, she was put into hospice care. And... Um, as her mind has started to, to fail her, um, I had the opportunity before it really was going to ask her some of her stories. Um, and I, I phrased it this way. I said, Martha Sue, I was just sitting there next to the hospital. I said, Martha Sue, I want to hear the stories of your life when God just showed up. Those moments where you just knew that God was present when he was there, without a doubt, you knew that he was with you. And she went into, over the course of two days, it took two days for us to talk through the different events in her life where God just showed up as a part of her story. Now, she talked about even at our wedding when my wife and I got married, how God showed up and that was a part of her story when God was so real and so present in her life. There's something about story um, that gives us insight into others, into their lives, but also into our own. When we talk about your story, um, it allows us to look at what God has done and could do. When Pastor Mike asked me to speak today, to preach today, um, he told me that he would love it if I would share my story. Um, some of you might know more about my story than others. Um, many of you probably don't, many of, don't know many of the details. Um, and I, I need you to know that it's difficult for me to share my story. And, and there's a few reasons why. Um, the first thing is, it, it's not just my story. Just like your story isn't just about you, it's, it's about more than that. My story really my story over the past eight years, as I think about it, is not just about me. It's also about my 10-year-old daughter, and it's about my wife and her family. 
It's about my mom and my dad and the support that they've given me. Um, It's about my sister and the truths that she has talked to me about. So when I think about my story, it's an incredible story, but it's difficult for me to share because it's not necessarily all mine to share. It's other people's story as well. Uh, The second reason why it's difficult for me to really share my full story is because it it includes a, a pretty dark season of life. It includes difficult things like going through a divorce. Um, It includes being a single parent. Um, The dark season of my life um, was about living in this tension of, will there be enough money? Um, Struggling with work. Do I have a place to live to take care of my daughter? Uh, This story of my life includes now having a blended family. And all of the struggles and trials that come with that, along with the joys. Uh, And and if you take all of these parts of this story, this dark season, along with those come all kinds of emotions. Just like in your lives, when you have parts of your life that were difficult or dark, there's emotions that uh, there can be fear and there can be anger. Um, You can struggle to know that God is with you. And so when I think about my story and I think about things like the doubts that I had at times, the doubts sometimes in God, often in myself, um, about lacking direction in life, hoping that just I would make it through another day. Um, That's kind of the reality of my story. Um, And another part of it was to spend hours on my knees regularly just asking God to be there. Because I know that without him, I wouldn't have made it through that season of my story. And I would bet that each of you have a part of your story that's similar to that. Maybe not the exact same. The details will be different. But you'll have a a dark and a dirty part of your story. There's going to be things that you want to forget, but you know that there's no way that you ever will. They'll always be a part of you. I know that there are things in my life, and I'm sure in yours also, that have shaped you to help make you who you are today, both in the good and in the bad. And who you are sitting here today, what has brought you into this place now, um, is your story. And so as we talk about this series of your story, when I talk about my story, I think about the impact that God has had. Now, just a minute ago, I, I said that stories can also give insight into our lives and into the lives of other people. Um, I think it also gives uh, insight into our God. In both the highs and the lows uh, in my story and in yours, I hope, you can see the hand of God that was present. That he was constantly molding and shaping you through those circumstances and through the things that he was doing to make you the person that you are today. Our stories are the place where the truths that we find in Scripture really come alive. They're active. They're working. It's in those stories that you and I have that we can see the Scriptures really take hold and become what God intended them to be, um, the truths that, that guide our lives. And I asked my mother-in-law about those God moments in her life. And she shared some pretty incredible things. And if I were to ask myself the same question, what about my own life? What about those God moments? I think that I would see that there's a common thread that that, that runs amongst the majority of them. That thread is the grace of God. Um, Grace. What, What is grace? Uh, It's something that's so difficult for us to just define with words. Um, In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we can read about grace. And in verse 9, it says, He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because anything that we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. An incredible verse on grace. It helps us to define, to give us a framework of what grace is. That there's 
grace is a part of our salvation experience. It's a part of God making us whole and right again with him. But still, sometimes it's difficult to understand just from words what is grace. Now, it, for instance, if I were to explain to you um, that I enjoy the idea of flying, I could explain to you how an airplane works. I could explain to you about lift and drag. I could explain to you about the, the Bernoulli effect and how uh, because of the differences in air pressure on a wing, you can have metal and wood that goes up in the air and defies gravity. Or I could tell you a story. I could tell you a story about me as a kid playing flight simulator with my dad on the computer. And we would spend hours learning how to fly from one airport to another. And in the process, I would read books on airplanes, and I got to the point where I could identify almost any airplane just with a glimpse of it. I've always loved flying. I could tell you about how when I was in college, my parents, as a birthday present one year, bought me a flight in a World War II trainer called a T-6 Texan. And it wasn't any regular flight. This was a, an acrobatic flight. And so in a matter of 30 minutes, we went upside down 60 times. Now, I could tell you about how the first time that we went into a loop, how we started at pretty high altitude, and we started to dive down in the pilot. I was in the front seat, and they were in the back, and they revved the engine up, and the, the engine got so loud, the noise just filled us, and how we gained speed, and the ground was coming closer, and then all of a sudden, he pulled up, and it went from seeing the ground to, to pointing up and just seeing blue sky. And then as we went higher and higher, as we started to go over the top, as we started to just work our way down. He pulled the throttles down on the engine so the noise of the loud engine went away. And as I looked up, which was really down, I could see the ground. And then as we started to come back down and he pulled back on the stick and leveled us out in flight and he said, now you want to try it. So I could tell you about how an airplane wing works. Or I could tell you a story about flying in a plane and doing a loop and almost losing it into the little bag. <laughs> I think in the same way, Jesus Christ often, though he would teach on many things, it seemed like when it came to grace, he often chose to show us. He often tended to use story and how he interacted with people to show us what the grace of God really meant. If we turn to Matthew chapter 4, we can see one of those accounts in Matthew, Jesus is right at the beginning of his ministry on earth. In Matthew chapter 4, and we'll look at verses 18, starting in verse 18. It says that as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said. And I'll make you fishers of men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. And it's such a unique story that these two guys are fishing. They're running the family business probably. And this random guy walks up and says, hey, come and follow me. And I'll teach you how to fish for people instead of, instead of for the things that are swimming in the ocean. And they just do. Like, they just drop their nets and go. But I think if you really understand what's going on at this time and the history behind this, this passage, I think we can see what's going on. See, back then, all of the young men would be put into rigorous training in order to become a follower of a rabbi. They'd go through education and training and all of these things where they would be taught all of the scriptures. They would memorize. They would try to make their lives as righteous as possible. And for the ones that learned the most, for the ones that showed themselves to be the brightest pupils, the ones that were kind of the stars of the class, a rabbi would come to them and say, come and follow me and I'll teach you more about this. I'll teach you how to be a rabbi. For the ones that didn't, the ones that weren't the star, the ones that weren't the perfect ones, that didn't have it all together, that couldn't do all the memory, they'd go back and work in their family business. They were the, the dropouts, the failures, the ones that couldn't cut it. And so we see these two guys in this passage, and they're, 
back working the family business at the age that they're at, they've already gone through this process of, are you going to be selected by a rabbi? Nope, didn't make it. Let's go back to the family business and let's just live out our lives as fishermen. But then along comes this guy, this guy that seems to be a rabbi. And out of the blue, he says to them, come and follow me. See, they had given up on this hope, this dream, this idea that they would be one that's chosen by God. They had thought, that's something that's for someone else. God's not going to choose me for that. I'm just going to go to the family business, and that's going to be my life. But in steps Christ. And he extends this offer to them that brings to them an incredible picture of grace. Because they weren't good enough. They didn't make it. They weren't the selected ones, the ones that were seen as the the, the perfect ones. And so they they couldn't follow through with it. But then Christ comes and said, I want you. Come and follow me. So we can see this picture of what the grace of God looks like in our lives, even through Christ calling the first disciples. I think about my life and I think about this idea of follow me. I I can remember the day when I felt that call from Christ. I was in seventh grade sitting in in school in my desk and I just overwhelming feeling, gosh, I need this Jesus thing in my life. I've been to church my whole life, but whatever things that have been gone on have set me up to this point where I know I need to respond to the call of follow me. And that's the grace of God, that he would choose me, a seventh grader sitting in a desk that's not perfect, doesn't have it figured out, and he would say, no, I want you to be one of mine. And I think that that's probably the story that many of you have as well. You can think back to that follow me moment, and you go, yeah, I didn't have it together. I wasn't the top or the best or the brightest. I wasn't the chosen one. I wasn't the one that that was taken by God as the cream of the crop. Yet still Christ said, follow me. And that's the grace of God. So we can talk about a definition of grace, but I think through story we can see it even more. Because it's so hard to find what grace is with just words, but then when we experience it, We know it. When we experience that grace, we know that it's from God. By grace, we have been saved. But grace doesn't end there. And that's, I think, part of the the beautiful thing about how God has, has freely given grace to us is that it doesn't just stop at this point where he says, follow me, and that's the extent of his grace to us. I can remember some years ago um, during this dark season of life that I was in, I found myself with four other individuals, and we were in an upper bedroom of an apartment buried deep in the heart of the Bronx. Um, in a really dangerous area, but we had gone to that place because we had gone there many times before to do missions work. And we, this small group of us went there because we wanted to seek out God's will for our lives. And I remember being up in this upper bedroom and, and, and asking God and praying to God, what is it that's next for me? I had been through some pretty tough seasons still in the midst of those. And just before I had gotten there, my sister had sent me a text message that included a a passage of scripture that's found in Joel chapter 2. And I'm not going to go there now, uh, but that chapter of scripture has incredible meaning to my life. And I could probably sit and talk about that passage for hours with you even this morning. But in that passage, uh, as I sat in this upper room in this small apartment in in the deep heart of the Bronx in New York, I felt like God spoke to me and that he shared with me that he had a plan for my future, that he had something for me that was not what I had experienced in the past, that he had something that was going to move me from this season of darkness and difficulty towards something that was better. And so I held on to those promises. 
I read that passage daily, often more than, more than once or twice a day. I, I would just clung to it. And I've seen those promises happen in my life. I've seen God come through with those things. And so I know that grace, yes, grace is how we are saved, but grace doesn't stop there. And I think that if it had stopped there, for me, I don't know where I would be right now, and I would bet for you, if grace stopped at the point of you are now one of Christ's, who knows where you would be right now also. But it doesn't stop. In fact, I think that if we continue to look at some stories about Christ's life, we can see some pretty unique things about the grace of God. If we turn to Luke chapter 23... We have another interaction. This is at the end of Christ's life here on earth. In Luke chapter 23, Christ is actually hanging on the cross in this story. And in verse 39, it says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. So we know the story that Christ was crucified and alongside of him were two criminals. These were men that were guilty of what they had done and Christ was innocent. And so Christ was just lumped together with these two criminals to be put to death. And one of these criminals says, if you're really the Christ, can't you save all three of us? But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. I, I read that story and I think about that interaction about Christ with these two criminals, one that's hostile towards him and the other one that rebukes the criminal and then says, Christ, I want you. I need you. I believe. I, whatever you have, I, I need you. And it, what it makes me think about this idea of grace is that grace is freely given to anyone that asks. Now, what could the criminal do? He couldn't do anything to receive this grace, right? Like, he couldn't do anything good. He's hanging on a cross. He's about to die. We know that he can't even go through some of the normal ceremonies of religion that, that were common at the time. He couldn't make a sacrifice to God in the temple. We knew that he couldn't be baptized. He couldn't take communion, though I know at this time communion hadn't yet really been put in place. Christ had just done it for the first time with the 12. So these normal practices that we see that are, we, we think of religion, this criminal had no opportunity. All he could do was say, Christ, I need you. That's all I've got. And so I think what we can learn from this is that even as we go through life, that grace is given freely. There's nothing that we can do. We can't earn it. We can't we can't try to balance out good versus bad in our life. This criminal couldn't do that. All of the bad had to be just wiped away by Christ. What an incredible picture of what salvation is like, but also what an incredible picture of what forgiveness is for us here on earth. That Christ would say, you'll be with me. And it's nothing that you could have done because you're hanging on a cross beside me. There's another story in Scripture found in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, Jesus is in the middle of ministry here on earth. He's just done, given the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous sermons that's ever been delivered. Incredible foundation for our Christian faith with the words that he had. And then it says, he came down from the mountainside. Large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. 
Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Now here's what I want you to understand about this story. The the idea of having leprosy during those times was like a death sentence. Now, if you think of, about the, the religious practices that they had, if you had something like leprosy, you would be considered unclean. And so you couldn't be around the people that were clean. So just by default, you were not righteous. You were in the wrong because you now had this disease, this thing that you couldn't get rid of. You couldn't take place in worship at the temple. You couldn't be with your family because you would make them unclean. You couldn't interact with a rabbi, a spiritual leader, because if you were to touch them, then they would become unclean. And so this man is at a point where he's, he, has, he doesn't know what else to do. His entire life has been changed forever. But did you catch what Christ did? He asked to be made clean And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches him. Jesus does what the society said you couldn't do. He did what all of the people would say, if you do this, you'll be made unclean. You can't touch the man. And Jesus touches the man, and then he says, I'm willing. Now now get this. Just as grace is freely given to each of us, In this story of Christ and this man, we can see that this idea of grace of God is given to us even before we have it all together. He didn't heal the man and then go and touch him. In his state that he was in, Christ walked to him and put his hand on him, broke all of the customs, all of the rules, and put his hand on him. Why? Because his grace was, this grace was not dependent on the man being made, made right first. In our lives, God wants to freely give us grace. And what's amazing is that he doesn't expect us to get it all together before he gives it. He doesn't expect us to, to, to get rid of every sin in our lives to become this perfect person just so that we can experience his grace. He doesn't want us to have everything put together. He wants to freely give grace and then offer forgiveness and help us put it together. So he makes the man clean and says, don't tell anyone, go show yourself to the priest and then go through the religious ceremonies. So the grace came before And in our lives, I think God wants the grace to come before, before we figure it out, before we clean ourselves up. I think that the grace is the part of us cleaning up. The grace is the part of our life being changed. There's another story briefly in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Christ is... Um, He's been traveling, and he appears to the people, and he's speaking to them and teaching them. In verse 3, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman that was caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. And the law of Moses commands us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? It goes on to say that they're setting a trap up for Jesus because what they're trying to get him to do is to say, yeah, you need to murder the woman to go along with the law, but then they're going to say, but you're telling us we should murder the woman. And instead, Jesus doesn't respond with words. In the story, we read that he bends down and starts writing in the sand. Doesn't say what he writes. Um, I'm sure that that's something that I'd love to know but he just starts to write or draw or doodle in the sand. And as he's doodling in the sand, he then looks up to them and he says this in verse 7. If any of you is without sin, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. And then he goes back to writing or drawing in the sand. And it says, as he's kneeling on the ground in the sand... One by one, oldest to youngest, 
they start to drop their rocks and walk away. I don't know what he's writing. Maybe he's writing out their sins in the sand so they can see the list of sins and then they're connecting with that's what I've got in my life. That's why I can't throw the first rock. Maybe he's writing their names down. Wouldn't that blow you away? I don't know what he's writing, but it, they all leave. And then Jesus straightens up, and this is what he asks her. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So we see this story of grace about this woman that's about to be stoned and this interaction that Christ has with this mob. And that's what it is. It's a mob of people. They're carrying rocks about to to kill a woman out in public. It's a mob of people that are ready to murder. And all Christ has to do is, whoever's innocent here, you throw the first rock. And then he leaves them at that. I've never seen a mob diffused by just a simple sentence or a simple idea, but Christ in his incredible wisdom is able to diffuse this mob and they leave. And when I think about this idea and how it, how it relates to God's grace, I think that it shows us that even when the world doesn't believe we deserve grace, God will give it. I mean, how many times have we gone through life and our experiences have shown us that the world doesn't approve? We've messed up. We've, we've gotten ourselves in a situation. We've sinned. We've found ourselves in a tough time, like, like the time that I was in in my life when I was dark and it was, it was just a, a, a tough time. And it's so easy for me to think, I can't have grace from God. The world, the world would tell me I can't have grace from God. But he freely gives it. And he gives it before I've cleaned myself up. And he gives it no matter what other people think. Now here's the the, the crazy thought, though. I have to believe that the woman probably didn't expect to receive grace either. So not only does Christ freely give grace to us when the world doesn't believe we deserve it, he freely gives it when we don't believe we deserve it. And in your life, I'm sure you can think about things and you think, there's no way. There's no way that I should receive grace. And you do. And you do. So when you or when I face a divorce or being a single parent or trying to figure out not having enough money and a place to live, when you or I try to go through dealing with a blended family or watching a loved one pass away and all of the emotions and fears and guilt and hurt that comes with those things, God gives grace. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, he says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And in our lives, we have those weaknesses. And that's what God's grace is for. I want us to pause just for a moment on this final story because there's other characters at play here. There's Christ who's drawing in the sand. There's the lady who receives this incredible grace of God. But there's also this group of people that are carrying rocks. And I would, I would dare say that there are times in my life and in yours where we're not the lady that's bent down that's about to be stoned, but we're the one that's carrying the rock. And what does God's grace do in that situation? It's given to us as well. And he says, drop your rock. Drop your rock. I know that there are rocks that I need to drop. 
Maybe it's for you, it's like me. Maybe it's towards a specific person that's done harm to you and you need to drop your rock. Maybe someone owes you money, someone stole something from you, someone just did a deal wrong with you. I think we need to drop our rocks. There's also this tendency, I think, for us as Christians to pick up our rocks and to be at the ready when it comes to particular issues in our world. We know that we are right and we know that others are wrong, that we're righteous, that others are sinners. We think that lifestyle doesn't line up with God. How can a Christian vote for that person, whatever it might be? And I think we need to drop our rocks. You want the grace of God in your life. I don't think you can take his grace while you've got a big rock in your right hand and reach out for the grace with your left. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, he says this, But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in love, we have kindled in you. See that you also excel in this grace of giving. He wants us to excel in grace. So let me leave you with a few thoughts. First one is this. I started by talking about God moments in life in mine and also in my mother-in-law's. And so my question is this, what about you? What are those God moments for you? When is it that God has showed up in your life without a doubt that he was present? Maybe that's a conversation that needs to take place at lunch today. Share with people, what are those God moments for you? Uh, Second thing is this, and it's very similar to the first, is what about that follow me moment? that time where you first experienced God's grace in your life, don't hold that from the people around you. Make sure people know about your follow me moment when, when Christ extended that call for you to follow him and you, you responded. The third is this. What part of your life do you need God's grace to show up in? What is it that you're going through right now? What is it that you're facing? What is it that is lingering what is the thing that you just feel like you can't get past what is it that you need God's grace to show up in right now ask him call out to him pray to him and he will give you the grace that you need and I saw people come forward and they have issues in their life when we prayed earlier they have things that they're going through struggles and they're here praying calling out to God, we all have those things. Even if we didn't come forward, we all have those things. Call out to God for his grace. Lastly is this. What rock do you need to drop? Who do you need to forgive? What area in your life do you need to excel at grace? a hard question, but it's one that if we can follow through on and drop the rock, I think that we will experience God's grace in our own life. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for the opportunity for us to hear from your word and to take this time to worship you with all of who that we are. God, as we think about your grace and how you have just poured it out upon us so undeservingly, uh, all we can do is thank you. God, I pray that as we go today, that we would go uh, with a desire to see more grace in our life and also a desire to give it to others. Father, we love you. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for being with us here today. I pray that as you go today, you will go with the peace and the grace of God.